Hi everyone, this is Paulo Rivera, and today we are going to do an inking demonstration. So, as you can see, I've already printed out something that we are going to ink. Uh, I've written out some of the different techniques that we're going to use, and then over on the side here, we have uh, a cyan printout of both pencils and inks that I had done previously. This is just so that uh, you can actually see what it is that I'm inking over, because uh, sometimes pencil doesn't show up on video, and also so it takes some of the pressure off me. Now what I'm doing here is uh, keeping the camera as close as I possibly can, so this is actually not the most comfortable way to ink, uh, but hopefully it is the best way to see. Now what I'll be using today is the Windsor Newton Series 7 number 6 brush. If you can see it there, I keep most of the ink towards the tip. You want to keep it away from the ferrule right here. And then the other brush, which I don't use that much, but occasionally I do for special effects, is the same series, Series 7, Windsor Newton, but it is the number 2 brush, and I also have it these sometimes. Uh, this is my very special brush, special because I do not take care of it whatsoever. Uh, if you can see here, I don't know if this will show in a close-up, um, you see how there is a bit of a gap between the ferrule and the actual hairs of the brush? This means that uh, over the years many have fallen out and so this brush is much less full than it was when I first bought it. Now the advantage of this is that it, uh, it kind of bends very very easily but mostly the reason I like it is the tip. It, it comes to a point at this uh, it still comes to a point, but in the beginning it was much, much sharper. And what I use it for now are things like dots and dashes, which I've written right there. And you'll see how I go about using that later. Alright, so let's get started. Now what you can't see is my brush washer right here to the side. But it's just a typical brush washer, and I've gone over that in previous posts. Now I like the number 6 brush because it has a great range to it, a lot of variation. So if I want a straight line, well, let's just say a line, uh, the trick is to lock your hand at a fixed distance or altitude from the paper. So just like that. But if you want a straight line, which always happens on buildings and whatnot, I use this ruler right here. It's kind of like a fancy roller ruler. Uh, it has a little channel right here, which is uh, it's supposed to be uh, where you grip it so that you can draw lots of parallel lines. But what I use it for in inking is a little guide that I can put my fingers into. So my, my middle finger glides in this little channel and then what it does is locks in the rest of my my uh, fingers at a, a fixed height so that I can start here and go all the way across. And the nice thing about having the parallel uh, ruler is that you can just roll it down a bit and then do a second parallel line. or a third. And so that's good for things like uh, speed lines and the, those kinds of things, but also buildings, windows, anything basically when you need a straight line and very little uh, variation. Next up we have tiny holes. And I know that's kind of like an odd thing to, to put there, but the reason I do is because I want to want to explain some of the brush dynamics of having a large brush. It's as if you have a tiny brush at the tip of a much larger brush. So when I do a small circle, it's just like that. And as you can see, the brush is not moving much at all. 
meaning the, the actual hairs of the brush, like the, uh, the brush as a whole is moving, but the hairs are not flexing much, only at the tip. And as you can see, I'm going at it in two steps, uh, one side and then the other. And that's mainly because it's always easier to brush things in a manner of pulling. Uh, you're almost always pulling. You're never really pushing unless you're going for some kind of special effect. So whether you're doing a line up here, you're always using the brush as a sort of shock absorber to kind of smooth out whatever it is that your hand is doing. And the only way you can do that is by pulling because you're using the actual friction of the paper to smooth out the line that you are drawing. So when you're doing the small circles, that same thing is happening but on a much, much smaller scale. Like I said, it's like a tiny little brush at the tip of a much larger brush. All right, next up we have dots and dashes. Now these are usually used to indicate uh, texture. Uh, some people use them more than others, but the important thing to remember here is that uh, the tip of this brush is very, very sharp. So sometimes if you don't want it to be that sharp, you have to place the brush down and then draw. So you see how that is, uh, I don't know if it's quite reading because it may not be zoomed in enough. Let me see if I can zoom in a bit there. Uh, it doesn't really go from thick to thin. It uh, is just an evenly now, dots can be trickier, especially with this brush. So that that's kind of the uh, the thing that most people don't take into account with a big big brush. Uh, the big brushes actually hold sharper points than do the smaller brushes. And I'll, I'll show you the difference right now. If I take the smaller brush, this is the one I never take care of. I never wash it. I, it when I'm done with inking, I just kind of rinse it off and then put it back. And I'm, I'm guessing I've been using it since 2006, roughly. <clears throat> All right, so you see also how it's kind of bent. That's kind of uh, a trademark of a badly, badly taken care of brush because it, it doesn't have any spring left to it. But that's actually what I want for this brush, which is why I keep it in this piss poor condition. So now you can see how it has a much blunter end and it's much better at these dots and dashes. This is great for texture like concrete or fur, as I'll show you later. All right, before I go on to the next section, which is thick to thin, I wanted to show the little tool that I use to keep my brush uh, properly loaded and clean before I even get to the point where I'm putting it on the paper. Uh, this is just a strip of paper. Uh, it allows me to test the ink and the brush uh, as I go along. I usually keep it folded up. You can see I also use it for painting. So this way, every time it gets too full, I just flip it over or unfold it. So what it is, is just three magnets. I should also mention that I always work on a, a magnet board, a metal board of some kind. So the first magnet, this little one like this, it has rubber on uh, this side to keep it easy to lift. From the, uh, from the metal, and then I put the paper towel on top of that. That allows me to modulate the water content of the brush. And then above that I have the paper, and lastly the last magnet. So I can just grab it from here, and I can put it wherever I want. So even though you can't see it throughout the video, it's uh, just above my paper. As you can see right here, I also have a very flat magnet, two of them and this keeps the paper stuck to the board uh, but still is easy to maneuver and rotate uh, move up and down, whatever whatever I need to do. Alright, so on to thick and thin. 
I'm going to go back to my number six brush, the big one. And we're going to do a rat tail stroke. Now I call it a rat tail stroke because that's actually what my dad used to call it. I don't know if he coined the term, but it's what I always heard when I was a kid. He was an airbrush artist. He still is, uh, aside from inking my own work. And uh, when he would teach airbrush classes in the 80s, he would uh, always talk about the rat tail stroke because it was the, the foundation of, uh, I guess, the, the, the way that you are able to control a line. If you can go thick to thin and do it quickly and efficiently and be able to reproduce the same motions over and over again, uh, then that is the foundation of going on to bigger and better things and actually being able to do things such as a uh, spring break t-shirt with uh, the Tasmanian devil on it. I remember a lot of those from my childhood. But anyway, the rat tail stroke. Now the, the basic thing is to like this. All it is is thick to thin by moving in pressing harder for a thicker line and then going up for a thinner line you can very easily just go thick to thin or the other way is starting out very high up high in uh, altitude as I say and uh, then going in closer to the paper and then coming back out. Now that's a really basic stroke, but if you can do this, and see, I just messed up there. If you can do this, then uh, you're on the right track. Now, once you've kind of mastered that stroke, uh, then you move on to feathering. And feathering is something that's, uh, I, I guess it's a hallmark of comics in general. Um, you know, as, as I mentioned in the very first post, Feathering, uh, or, or rather inking, is, is what was necessary because of the printing process. And feathering is a way to kind of break up a black and white option so that you can get something that approaches a gray. And the way you do that is very simply, it's just a series of lines, and you've all seen it. Just like that. Let me see if I can zoom in a bit. Like I said, this is kind of an odd angle. Uh, and inking is all about getting the right angle, which is why you want to be able to freely rotate your paper. different ways to do it. I mean, people feather many different ways. So if you're someone like Mobius, uh, you know, early in his career, I was just, I was just looking at some of his work on Blueberry. He had a very, very heavy hand. I mean, obviously he was, he was always an amazing draftsman, but uh, a lot of his stuff was very, very heavy handed with the black and the feathering. And, uh, you know, when, when I think of his style, it, it, it does involve a lot of feathering, but as he got older, he, he moved away from the very, very thick to the very, very thin, and instead just went thin, thin, all the way around like this, almost using the feathering as a, as a sort of cross contour that would give his otherwise clear line drawings a little bit more form. So if he drew something like this, cylinder, then he would go back and he would put little things like that. And knowing him, he would probably put in some little dots to give the thing some texture. He liked making everything look like it was made of stone. Alright, so I hope that, that covers feathering. Now, those are, are, you know, everything I've covered up to this point. Let me zoom out a little bit. Uh, straight lines, small circles, dots, dashes, rat tail, feathering. 
that can all then be combined into different effects. So hair, fur, and stubble, that's really just um, a different form of feathering or the rat tail. Uh, same with trees and foliage, and in the very end I'll show dry brush, but that's actually the, the simplest of everything. So with hair and fur, you know, there's, there's no one right way to do it, but the way I like to do it is to take, you know, I'll bring the, my little bridge out here first. I like to water down the brush or the, or the ink just a tad and then splay out the brush. So if you'll see that right there, let me see if this is, if I get it to focus. There we go. So you'll see uh, once you flatten out the brush, the very tip will start to splay a little bit and you'll actually get several mini brushes as part of your big brush. Another advantage to having a large brush. So what happens now is you, if you then take it and zoom in again. See, you get uh, a number of parallel lines that you can then go any which way with. And of course, if you hold it at a constant angle, then you get sort of a calligraphic effect. But what happens is, if you go sideways too much, then you end up losing your splay. So right now I did that once, and it, uh, it reduced the number of mini brushes down to about two, which can still be useful in uh, some circumstances, but it may not be what you want. So I'm gonna flatten out the brush again. So, as you can see, you can kind of just build this up. And pretty soon, you do this enough times, and you start to get either hair or fur or whatever it is that you're trying to recreate. So usually when I'm, if I'm inking myself, I'll set out some... Uh, some pretty rough pencils. I just want to get the major flow of the hair and uh, then when I get to the inking stage it's almost still like a drawing stage. I'm, I'm still thinking about where to put things so the pencils aren't quite as uh, as tight as I, I usually draw because it, it doesn't matter like it, it's not an issue of draftsmanship like if you draw one hair out of place it's really not going to matter and it makes it easier when using a brush as opposed to a pencil. Because drawing hair with a pencil, you know, you've just got this tiny little tip and it's not going to do much. But with a brush, you can lay down a lot of color or a lot of ink at one time. All right, so I hope, hope that makes sense. Uh, I will show this on some actual examples. Okay. So next we have trees and foliage. I'm going to zoom out just a tad. All right, so there's lots of different ways to do this, but I have kind of a generic tree and foliage uh, technique that I use, and that is related to the small circles that I was showing earlier. So this is the, the outline part of it. As you can see, it moved very, very quickly and the brush does not flex very much at all. It's really just the tip of the brush. My, uh, my dad used to do caricatures back in the 80s and uh, he would, he would tell me that you could tell uh, which uh, if a if a cartoonist was right or left-handed by which way they drew the drew the caricatures. So my dad's right-handed, so he he always drew everybody facing left. And uh, as you can see with these trees, <laughs> I'm only doing them in one direction. 
So what would happen if I if I had to go the other direction to draw the other side of the tree? I'd actually move my hand uh, around a bit. Let me zoom out so you can see. So here I'm I'm going like this, and then I move my hand, and I do the other side. So the angle actually matters quite a bit because your hand has a, a definite, you know, it, it's a physical object, so it, it can literally get in the way sometimes. And that's also another thing with inking is uh, with penciling, I kind of jump around the page a lot and I, I just pencil whatever it is that I, I feel most excited about. But with inking, it really is a good idea to start at the top left corner and go the other way, uh, all the way to, to the uh, bottom right. If, of course, you are right-handed. If you're left-handed, it's the other way around. But uh, with, if you're inking, you really don't want any smudges, and that's the, uh, the most surefire way to, to make sure that you don't have them. So this is like the exterior, and these are really, really bad trees. I'm, I'm just showing you the, the tricks. Uh, that's when I would go back and kind of put in some shadow. And this is an action, actually a, a good candidate for my smaller brush, mainly because it has that blunt point that gives you those nice dots and dashes. So, you know, when I first started out, this didn't look any good, but you can kind of save it by looking and, and spotting your blacks. Now, spotting your blacks, I, I don't really have a whole lot of time to go into, but the basic idea is more of a compositional idea than a technique. It's, a, it's more about graphic design. You want to place the black in the right spaces. And what are the right spaces? Well, you just kind of have to play it, well, I say play by ear, but play by eye. You just look at what you're doing and try and make it look like something that is real. Uh, and most of the time that means that you are finding the shapes that read the best. And that means not a whole lot of overlap, you know, you want to make sure that each shape has its own space and that if one object is in front of another, then it uh, it appears to clearly do that. Uh, that means that your, your outlines cross, you know, things like no tangents and everything, but when you're talking about spotting blacks, it's a little bit more abstract. I'll have to do a whole other post on that to really really get into what it's all about, but it's basically a graphic design issue, not a technique issue. So these are just kind of like generic bushes that I'm drawing, but uh, I also use it for like trees and things. And you know, if, if I want to turn this into a tree, I just add some trunks here, maybe another like that. I've almost turned the brush into a kind of wedge, which gives me a... Uh, you see that? It's kind of like a, a flat chisel. So... You know, most people, they, they look at the brush and they think, okay, I have to ink like this. And honestly, when I use it, uh, mostly I'm, I'm going at an angle to the paper. So even though the, the brush is facing to the top left, I'm going perpendicular to that. Even when I'm drawing something like a line, uh, because that's what gives me kind of a little bit more... Um, I don't know, texture to the paper. If, if you're, um, you know, as I was talking about earlier as a shock absorber, if you go uh, 
in the parallel direction with your stroke, then your brush is going to fill in every single crease and crevice as if it were the suspension of a car. Because that pressure is pressing down, and it's in the same line as the, uh, as the stroke, it's going to fill in every single crevice. But if you go at a perpendicular angle, it's going to leave that little trail right at the edge there. And of course, this is bringing us into, into dry brush. Now, dry brush is, you know, it's called dry brush, but it's really not all about having a dry brush. Now, I've, I've taken a little bit of paint off of my brush, but not much. It's still pretty, pretty uh, filled with ink. What it's doing is it's creating a, uh, a gradation of pressure on this side of the brush. So, again, I'm right-handed. So the sharp edge is going to be at the tip, like this. But the underside is going to have the softer edge. And of course, the faster you go, the drier it's going to look. So you could even uh, you know, do almost a full-scale gray over an entire section like that, but most of the time, uh, you know, I'm just going for pure black and white, but I just want a softer edge on, uh, let's say, Spider-Man or whatnot. All right, I hope that covers just about all the, the basic techniques. Now I want to show some of the actual inking. So here we have Spider-Man. Uh, some of the things I will use on him are, uh, you know, the basic lines. Uh, so his webbing, I don't ever put a lot of variation in, but uh, his outlines sometimes do. So I, I use him as an example because he's got kind of everything. Sometimes you use dry brush on him. Uh, you know, the outside is going to be nice and smooth like that. He's got a little bit of everything, every kind of texture. It all goes in there. Now, if you are having a problem with spotting blacks, what I would suggest is before you even start inking, print it out on a separate sheet of paper and just do an ink study. Uh, and, and it actually helps the, the smaller it is, the, the more it will help you because you'll have less control at a smaller size and you'll have to concentrate on what works, what reads, so that when you get to the actual inking, you'll know where to put that stuff. Now, spotting blacks is actually somewhat of a lost art in terms of inking because a lot of what what that skill is is actually accomplished by the pencilers these days. Uh, if you look at most professional pencilers, especially for, for publishers like Marvel and DC, their pencils are super, super tight, and, and uh, so are mine uh, as well. Like, if I were inking for myself, I would be much, much looser. But when I'm inking for my dad, I, I go very, very tight. And so when you go that tight, the penciler is actually making the decisions of, of where to spot blacks, not the inker. But back in the day, it was a little bit different, uh, the way everything worked. I think also it, the, the industry wasn't as spread out as it, as it is now. I mean, you probably in the day 
back in the day knew who your inker was and, and possibly even worked in the same studio with him. So just the, I guess the psychology was that was a lot different. This Spider-Man drawing was part of a series of sketches I did for the Ultimate Spider-Man TV show. They wanted, wanted some of my character designs, which was pretty cool. I'd never really worked on anything like that before. But uh, as a result, I, I never actually inked this. So when I decided to do this today, I just picked this out of my May files on my computer and said, oh, I'll try that. Some of the examples I'll we'll show next are things that I, I already inked, and so I don't have to think about them as much because I already made most of the major decisions. As you can see, I, I try and accomplish most of the inking on the first stroke, but occasionally it doesn't work out the way I'd like to. And sometimes I even have to go back back in with whiteout. If you didn't catch the last post, uh, what I use for whiteout is um, Holbein acrylic wash, which is actually an acrylic paint, but it dries to a matte finish, just like wash. And again, the way to avoid a super fine line like these, for instance, is to put the brush down first, get get a kind of feel for the paper, and then go with the stroke. Because if you go very, very quickly, the, uh, the brush is going to leave a very, very sharp point, both at the beginning of the stroke and at the end of the stroke. Alright, let's get into some of the webbing here. I'm not going to finish this. I just wanted to show some of the techniques because it's it's one thing to talk about inking and it's one thing to see a time-lapse video, but in order to really understand it, you've got to just do it. And you really got to see how the brush moves. I mean, really what you're doing, is, as with anything, that any kind of skill, craft, whatever, you, you, what you're doing with practice is you're building a model in your mind of the physical world. And the more you practice, the more the model that is in your mind, uh, the more it will match up with reality. And when they overlap almost completely, that's that's when you've really got it. You know, it happens with drawing, it happens with basketball. You know, at some point you just get a feel for it. And that feel is really just a model. It's a simulation of the world. The more you do something, the closer your simulation gets to reality. I'm not going to draw his entire hand here, but I always like to give Spider-Man dirty hands and dirty feet. And uh, 
usually that means a little bit of dry brush. So, right here on the palms of his hands, go like this. Slowly build up that dry brush. Now as you can see, I, I just did dry brush, but now I'm going into line. So, so you can see that it's not actually that the brush is dry. It just has to do with the speed and the handling and also the angle. Don't forget the web shooter. All right, so I, I said I was going to do some, some lines, and obviously I lied. So uh, let's do them now. I, I noticed, I don't know if you heard me breathing in there, I've noticed that I don't breathe when I draw spidey lines or anything that's kind of like that. So I'll, I'll do a few columns and then uh, then you'll hear me take like a deep breath. Or I guess I breathe out, but I breathe in. Doing this a little bit faster than I usually would, but I just want to kind of show you the, the basics of it. Uh, as you can see, like this line is too thick, that line's too thin. Uh, if I were doing this for a final, a final piece, I'd take a little bit more care, go a little bit more slowly, and uh, everything will come out a little bit more even. You know, it, the spidey spidey webs are. They're one of those things in inking that it, it's not really anywhere else. Like, I wouldn't do this technique anywhere else where you just have line after line after line that is completely unvarying. But in this case, the webbing, it's, uh, you know, it's part of his costume, obviously, but it's its also, uh, it works as kind of like a texture. So when, you know, if I were to show the webbing or do, finish the webbing for the entire figure, it kind of identifies everything that it's in as one complete shape. It's almost like even though you're not painting it red, it still is reading as a, a, a uniform color, you know, quote unquote color. Um, which is why I think it's actually such a, a great design. Uh, I think Jack Kirby did it, but uh, you know, Steve Ditko is the one who made it famous, and I'd say John Romita, who came after after Steve Ditko. He's the one that really codified it. Uh, you know, when most people think of Spider-Man, they usually think of John Romita Spider-Man because he's the one that made all the webbing go the quote-unquote right way. Uh, Steve Ditko, the the little scallops, you know, they, they changed direction all the time. They went kind of everywhere, which I, I like that look, but, uh, you know, anything that happened, like the Spider-Man movies, it's really based on Romita's uh, Spider-Man. All right, I'm going to do the eyes, and then we're going to move on. Because it is not Spider-Man until... You draw the eyes.
let's move on to some other examples. I'm actually going to move the camera here because I'm not working on my my normal board is much much bigger but that has a big ping attached to it now so I had to take it off. This is my my much smaller board that I, I use when I need to take places. It's a 12 by 18 dry erase board that I bought from some educational supply company. I got two of them. They work pretty well. So let's do some hair. Now what I'm doing is I'm flattening out my brush like I did before. As you can see it's kind of splayed out at the tip there. This is a Wolverine Wolverine drawing. It, I think this is actually the inks uh, that I did back in 2009 for a Zeb Wells story. It featured Spider-Man and Wolverine going into a bar. It's actually pretty fun. And weirdly emotional. That's the thing about these, these comics. You know, if you talk to an artist, writer, editor, these characters, I mean, they, they live and breathe for us, so we often talk to them like, we talk about them as if they're real people. Because if, if you're gonna, if you're gonna write or draw a, a good story, you, you have to believe in them, at least in some way. Uh, and if you don't, then your reader definitely won't. It's one reason I do my uh, Wacky Reference Wednesday thing, so people can see that, you know, when I do a, any kind of drawing, half the fun of it is just getting into the character's state of mind. You know, like I know how to draw a hand. I can I can draw a hand from from memory, but it may not have the right gesture. I mean, the gesture has to be spot on if it's going to read as a as a living, breathing character. This scene takes place in the snow, so I had like some some wind going by, and then I had small circles. Those were the little drops of snow, little snowflakes falling through the air. So I, I picked this panel just because I had a lot of different textures going on, you know. And wasn't really thinking about it when I did it, but as all the techniques that I was talking about today. So even though he's got this nice fur collar, as Wolverine usually does, it's the same basic techniques as foliage. You know, a lot of inking is really just cartooning. It's, it's coming up with certain patterns and symbols that represent things in the real world. You know, most of the time, uh, especially on muddy colors, you know, you've got a lot of painters and, uh, you know, artists who are, who are concerned about representing reality. And uh, I like to do that too, but inking kind of it, it takes a different part of your, your brain. You know, it, obviously the draftsmanship part of it is 
basically the same. But the finish, the finish is much different. Because what you're worried about is not really the way that light plays on an, uh, an object, although that does come into effect. It's, it's more about getting an idea across. So here, you know, in, in this particular panel, obviously I wanted a certain lighting effect. He's standing on the street, you can't see it here, but in a previous panel you'll see that he's standing in the street and he's under a street light and it's nighttime. So you've got this kind of light coming from above and, uh, you know, stage right. And, uh, you know, I want to get that idea across, but if I were to paint, I would have to take a photo of either myself or some kind of model, some kind of, uh, you know, head sculpture that I, I'd done. But when you're inking, all you have to worry about is that the idea gets across. You'll see sometimes, especially on faces, instead of doing one line, I'll do two quick ones. And again, it goes back to, to feathering. You're, you only have two options, black and white. Uh, but if you do two quick lines, it's going to read as a, a lighter, lighter black, basically, a gray, uh, a lighter, a lighter gray than you would if uh, you went with a solid line, even with a, a thin solid line. dry my brush out a little bit, you know, drag it across my paper towel, and then I'll do the little, you know, he's in the cold, so I always like giving him a little bit of, a little bit of uh, breath you can see. Load the brush back up and fill in some more blacks. And of course, it's not Wolverine unless he has stubble. I'm moving very, very quickly, and I'm not changing the altitude of my hand. And this gives me a lot of little wispy strokes. If this, uh, we're going to be something that wasn't for print, like if it was a, uh, a commission for somebody, you know, somebody who was going to take the original art. Sometimes I would actually do a wash. Not necessarily a wash, but I, I would water down the ink just a bit so that you get even more of a gray effect. But of course, something like that isn't going to read uh, in a comic book. Because what happens is it's just part of the process. Like even though the uh, the printing process has improved quite a bit since comics were first printed, uh, just because of the assembly line process, when the inks get sent around, they're sent in uh, bitmap files, which are pure black and pure white, and uh, that means the files are very small. So we're, you know we're talking finished art is less. I mean, it's usually half a megabyte, if that, even for really complicated stuff. But uh, the trick is, it's it, it has to be at very, very high resolution because when you have just black and white, that means there's no um, 
uh, grays whatsoever. And so the grays are what make a, a curve seem smooth. That's what they call anti-aliasing, if you're familiar with the term. I think that's about all I'm going to do on Wolverine. Let's move on to Sandman. I'm going to move the camera just a tad. Uh, Sandman I wanted to show because it's one of the few times where I'll actually switch brushes. If I have to do a lot of the dots and dashes, that's when I'll use the number two Windsor and Newton. Again, I want that blunt blunt tip. And also, you know, because he's made of sand, there's not a lot of uh, shadow on him, although I will do that sometimes. Let me see if I can zoom in a little bit, because it's, it's kind of tough to see. You know, not a lot of, of variation. There There's some. There's some variation, but it's very minimal. never comes to a solid point. It's as if every end is a, uh, a small circle of, of some kind. Now because he's made of sand, I, I, I usually try and leave the, the outline pretty open. I do the same technique if I want to do um, snow, like uh, for old school Iceman, where he looked more like a snowman. Uh, this is the way that I would ink him. I haven't done that too much, but there was one cover where I had to draw old school Iceman. I think I might have used the same brush on new school Iceman as well. Uh, the, you know, the difference being that he's uh, he's made of like ice, so there's lots of like jagged edges and that and that kind of thing. If I were gonna copy Mobius's, you know, later later style, this is probably the brush I would use, because he he uses a lot of little strokes that um, they don't really build up, but they add they add up to something more. You know, they they don't build up in the sense that anything gets darker, but the overall effect is something that. Is often very very three dimensional. Again, because he's he's not only using it as a texture, but it's a sort of cross contour. You know, if this if this were a Mobius thing, he would, he would go back in and do something like that. You know, maybe any time you get like a major fold, a cheek, and then of course everything would have little dots and dashes to show some of the texture.
All right. Uh, hopefully that that shows about all you need to know. Um, let me see what we've got left. I know this is already it's kind of going over time. I showed you the basics of hair. You know, again, I would use like a number six brush for this. I used a little bit of dry brush earlier. This is a a uh, cyan print of a previously inked drawing. Um, it's a World War II story, actually. But uh, this, this is what I wanted to end on. So right here is uh, from the same Wolverine story, uh, Wolverine Spider-Man story. And it's a very, very small. So you can see I printed these at the same size. So this was a close-up of Wolverine. And then this is a later panel. I don't show a lot of the background, but just focused on the figure. And the reason I'm showing this is not so much about technique, but to just touch on the idea of spotting black. And when you're inking, you know, most people think of outlines. And uh, that is true, you know, that, that's the classic comic book style. But the smaller a figure gets, the, uh, the further away from outlining you have to go. So as you can see here, You know, I start with an outline. Maybe go here and here. But at a certain point, you realize you can't really outline it. It's not going to show. And so that's what spotting blacks is all about. So you have to just make the executive decision and say, this is going to be in shadow. Now again, um, I've already kind of made that decision. This is a reproduction of an, of an ink finished page that I had already done. But I just wanted to show that, you know, it's not all about outlines. It's about graphic design. It's about thinking in shapes. So I'll do a little bit of feathering. Now you have an outline on the side where the light is coming from. But the smaller those figures get, the smaller they get, the, the less outline you do. Well, one, because it won't read, and too, because it, it just looks better. You know, you don't even have to have things line up perfectly. Again, that's what it is about inking, is all you're concerned about is getting the idea across. So if I've already made you understand that this is a jacket, then I've kind of done my job. I don't have to do anything else about it. You know, maybe I want to show, you know, maybe the idea I want to convey is that the light is coming from up here and it's hitting him. But once I've done that, you know, I can call it quits. You know, and you can still throw in a few dots and dashes because in the story he had just gotten, uh, he'd gotten shot, which usually happens in a Wolverine story, but I'm not judging. Usually makes for good stories. And again, you just want to get the idea across. Like normally if I was drawing Wolverine up close, like in that, I don't give him the uh, the wolf haircut, but from far away I'll switch things up and I'll give him the two little ears. You know, I want people to look at this tiny little drawing no matter how small, no matter how far away, and say, oh, that's Wolverine walking down the street in the middle of a snowstorm. All right. I hope you guys enjoyed that. 
That's the end of the inking demo. If you have any questions, uh, please either ask me on YouTube or on the blog. Thanks for watching.